Good evening. And welcome to the creepy little book. How you doing? I'm your host, P. Your humble MC of the evening who will lead you through the world of the weird. But tonight, we're very lucky. Because tonight we have with us a guest, a ufologist and a researcher by the name of Christina Gomez. And if you guys haven't been paying attention, she has been an up and comer in the world of ufology, straight like a top, rocket top to the top, rocket to the top, rock it all. So watch out for her. Here she comes. Here we go, Christina. How you doing? Hey, what's poppin'? Good to see you. Good to see you. Glad, glad you could be here. Thank you for being with us tonight. Ah, oh, I'm glad I come in with the music too. That's right. That's right. So good. We, that's how we set the mood around here. It's like get the mood nice and weird. The music to set the tone, and we all know what's going to happen. We're going to delve into the fringes of the world tonight. And tonight's topic are ancient UFOs. So uh, one of my favorite things combined with oh, another one of my favorite things, the ancient world and UFOs. So it should be a good one. Should be a good one, especially with you along for the ride tonight. With your uh, definitely wealth of knowledge on the topic of the UFO and UAP phenomenon. I'm telling you guys, right on the, the razor's edge of what is happening in the world of UFOs and UAPs as these guys are. Especially Christina here. It's all the books. All the well, there you go. You got to stay on top. You got to do all this reading. It's reading, got to do the reading. That's why I don't have friends. Just read all day. <laughs> <laughs> you think I'm joking? <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. You, who needs friends? You'll have friends later when you're doing, you know, uh, contact in the desert. <laughs> when you're doing speaking engagements there, that's when you have all your friends. No, no, hold on. I got a super chat here. I'm going to get to real quick from Arel Avant for ten dollars. Thank you so much, Arel Avant. I do appreciate that. Very generous of you. Now, Arel Avant says you should sell actual copies of your creepy little book. I would buy it. Well, thank you, Arel Avant. That's a great idea. Actually, I'm 160 pages into the creepy little book. I just need to find an illustrator to illustrate it. That is the style of illustration that I like, and who works on a scale that I can afford. And uh, and then we will get something done. But thank you for your interest in that. I also want to thank, thank you to our moderators, Tina Tomaszewski and Big Steve, for being here tonight. Thank you both for tuning in. Uh, I see a lot of familiar faces here with us as well. Jack D. Whiskey, Chef Nation, Man Ray of Hope, Raquel Super Saiyan Girl. And everybody remember, after tonight's stream, Raquel Super Saiyan Girl is doing a birthday stream for It's Courtney. Ooh. So don't hesitate to tune in over there. Happy yeah, so that's birthday. Beautiful. Yes. Happy birthday. And we always celebrate people's birthdays here in the community. The community of the curious, I call it. Strange folks who tune in nightly to hear me talk about these weird things. So... Um, I don't really like to do interviews so much, Christina, but we should get to know you a little bit. So let me ask you a question I ask anybody when I come on my channel. All right. I'm ready. What got you into this weird stuff? Okay. I love this story because I'm going to tell you right now. The thing that got me into this was my dad showing me the TV show, The Twilight Zone, from like the 1960s, right? Yeah. So... On the Sci-Fi Channel, every single New Year's, it plays for 48 hours. So we would binge watch it from, like, the age of 7 to, like, 18. And ever since then, because it hits all kinds of topics about Absolutely. the fringe, the paranormal, aliens, everything. In a time when it was completely taboo or not believable, right? So mm -hmm. having it at that time in black and white, fantastic actors... That's what got me where I am today. That is awesome. It was very similar for me. Television. Uh, there was a show called In Search Of and Arthur C. Clarke's Mysterious World. And then along came things like sightings. You know, there was kind of a boom in that kind of entertainment between the 70s and the 90s uh, that you would see in reruns. And, of course, Unsolved Mysteries was a big one back then that they brought back recently on Netflix. Uh, but, yeah, all those kind of programs did it for me. It was definitely television that kind of led the way. Uh, and then the books come later. The books definitely yes. come in later. You know, as a kid, my mom would take me to the library and I would research all these strange things from, uh, you know, mysterious places like Stonehenge to various UFO activities. So I'm sure it was the same for you. You got sucked into all the books, too. 
Oh, completely. I mean, when I, in high school, I would never go to lunch. I would always hang out in the library, like when, before school started, during lunch and after school. I only had two friends. One of them was actually the librarian uh, and we would hang out and like eat lunch together. So the library and me are best friends. <laughs> Very good. I can, I can really admire that. The good old library, you can't beat it. I, I think it's, uh, it's not what it used to be because we live in such a technological age. Yeah. But uh, but in one time, a uh, very important place to many communities, the old local library. Speaking of a simpler time. <laughs> yes. Anyway, speaking of simpler times, let's talk to some ancient times. So uh, some of these ancient UFO sightings I came across, uh, the oldest one I could find here, uh, speaks to something called the Tatuli Papyrus. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was uh, supposed to be a transcription of an Egyptian papyrus from the reign of Tutmos III, originating in a 1953 article published in Doubt, the Forty in Society magazine. Uh, it was sent to a guy named Boris D. Rachelwiltz, who found the original transcription of Papyrus among papers left by a man named Alberto Tulli, a deceased Vatican Museum director. References to circles of fire or fiery discs contained in the translation have been interpreted in UFO and 14 literature as evidence of ancient flying saucers. Although Jacques Vallée and Chris Albeck have described it as a hoax, according to Vallée and Albrecht, the Thule had supposedly copied it during a single viewing of the original papyrus using an ancient Egyptian shorthand, and Ratchelwitz had never seen the original. So this alleged text likely contains transcription errors, making it impossible to verify. But that didn't stop Von Daniken from including his speculations of ancient visitations by extraterrestrials based on this in the 1968 Condon report. So I don't know. Um, here's the thing that I like to do. Mm. I like to suspend disbelief personally when it comes to these kind of things. Is it, I don't know. Do you think it's possible they had these kind of sightings in the ancient past and recorded them? I do. I think the Egyptians recorded yeah. a lot. I mean, that, that's what they're good at, is recording their history, the things that they see all the time. And I like the fact that they stated, even in the translation, that it was fiery disks, not disks of light, because light didn't really, right? Like, electricity didn't exist back then. All they had was fire. Right. So I think that's a fascinating thing that was pointed out and was kept through the translations. That is a very astute observation, and one that I didn't even uh, notice myself there. The idea that we are talking about something they could only reference because they did not understand any other concept of light besides fire. So seeing lights dancing in the sky, they wouldn't have no other way to quantify it. Very good point. Very good point here. Uh, now, of course, you're going to have uh, big names are attached to this. If you got Valet who's saying this is a hoax, that's going to carry a lot of weight. Yeah, of course. But on the other hand, you're going to have Von Daniken come along. Uh, who's been a champion of the ancient astronaut theory since the 60s, who's going to add a whole different level of credibility to it. Now you got two camps forming here. This is how this is how these this is how divisions start here. You have people <laughs> on the Von Daniken side, you're going to have people on the Valet side. <laughs> I mean, it's hard to choose because they're both so credible. It's like, which one do you believe? Where do you get your evidence from, your information from? Because they've both probably seen the same thing, or at least information that is very similar. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, working from the same information, absolutely. Now, listen, I've got some super chats pouring in here, so I'm gonna go nice. ahead and yeah, I got, I got to address these real quick if you don't mind. I try, I try, I try to be polite to the chat, especially when they're uh, when they're coming in here like this. Jack D whiskey for three ninety nine. Got a cup of coffee for me. Thank you, Jack D whiskey. Much appreciated. And it's Courtney for two ninety nine saying, yo, what's up, Courtney? Fellow Philadelphia in there, it's Courtney. And it's her birthday today, everybody. So don't forget to say happy birthday to Courtney there. Uh, Chef Nation for $50. Thank you, Chef Nation. <laughs> Holy <laughs> smokes, thank you for the Cameo Fund. That is awesome, Chef Nation. Thank you so much. Definitely put that towards the Cameo Fund. Um, oh, oh, and Chef Nation again for another $50. Chef, you spoil me. <laughs> Thank you so much. It is great to see you, and you are so generous. Thank you so much, Chef. A little something for your track suit. That's what I'm talking about, Chef. Thank you so much. And you know what? We're gonna have to do. I'm gonna have to do a poll just to pick out the color of the track suit here. 
It's going to have to be. I'm going to have to do an audience poll. It's too many people have contributed to this tracksuit fund. Um, and, and it looks like the burgundy is the winner. Burgundy? I was going to guess gold. They it have a like yellow one, but it looks flashy. like mustard. Mm. It looks a little too mustardy. <laughs> a little too mustardy. Yeah, well, so I guess I don't know. we'll see what the poll says. You know what? Maybe the mustard is going to end up winning. <laughs> it might be. It could. You never know. You never know. I could be the mustard tracksuit guy. Uh, Tina's yelling for the burgundy. Yes, everybody seems to like the burgundy. I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to get a haircut. I'm going to get a burgundy tracksuit. Roy, it's going to be a brand new look. Brand new look, brand new Pete. It's going to be a lot of fun. Everybody's going to really like it. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. I want to see. Good, good. Every, I think everybody's looking forward to it. It's a brand new day. Um, so speaking of these fiery discs in the sky, these were not the only people to encounter these uh, these strange creatures. Uh, well, I don't want to say strange creatures because we have no idea they're creatures. There's lights in the sky. That's what we know so far. And uh, And that's another thing that always fascinates me, how we jump from lights in the sky to creatures from space but that's a story for another another topic um uh so let's talk about rome ancient rome we talked about ancient egypt but we've got reports from ancient rome from 218 bc from 218 bc so there was a chap that lived in ancient rome okay his name was livy livy he was a historian his name was titus livius and he was a roman historian he wrote from the founding of the city Okay, he was a big time uh, historian, big guy. He's a, he's a big guy, he's a big deal kind of guy. Hey, Livy. So he recorded a number of portents in the winter of the year, including phantom ships that had been seen gleaming in the sky. 218 BC, phantom ships gleaming in the sky in the Roman Republic. Now, you can't really get more blatant than that. There's something being seen in the sky. And it's a phantom ship. What else could it be? What else could it be but what we consider an unidentified flying object? Right. These and ancients. I mean, they, they, they weren't stupid people by any measure. Mm -hmm. They were absolutely the builders of great empires, of great architecture, of great civilizations in the ancient times. Now, they might not have had all the modern amenities that we do to this day, but they were nonetheless intelligent people. So to record something like shining ships, gleaming the sky, phantom ships, no less. I think we're talking straight UFO encounters. I think that's what we're saying here. So why and, do you think? Why do you think it was categorized as a phantom ship? What do you think? What do you think he's like? What do you think he saw when he when he says that? Maybe for him, he associated them with some kind of spiritual connotation at that time the daemons of their belief system religiously uh that could have been some kind of idea i mean when we're talking about portents to begin with you know we're, we're talking about signs or warnings that something's going to happen so we're already talking about something supernatural so i think perhaps there might be a supernatural religious connotation to his idea that these were phantom ships were they somehow related to the spirits in some way mm. i think that's a really fascinating point i mean i was thinking something completely different but i really like what you said when, when you bring in the past more specifically i mean when i thought of phantom ships i thought something of more of like an interdimensional maybe like fading in and out you know kind of like what a ghost does that's what came to my mind so i like how ours were very different but i think really interesting on both sides Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I love this idea of interdimensional possibility being an aspect of what these things could be. You know, are these kind of experimental craft from some people in another dimension who are experimenting with interdimensional travel the way we do with space travel? Is it the next logical step for a civilization to experiment with interdimensional travel? Perhaps. You know, uh, we are seeing explorers from beyond our reality. You know, Unless, if only we could ask. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. If they just park for a minute and do some discussing, but they're very elusive, whatever they are. You know, and I, I always say this. I, I find the fact of the matter that we take this idea of lights in the sky and equate them with creatures from space. Uh, fascinating. Like, how did that, how were those leaps and bounds made? 
between Mount Rainier in 1947, Roswell in 47, Aztec, you know, these, these different recoveries happen. And all of a sudden we're talking spacemen. But before that, we're just, you know, we're looking back through ancient history and we're seeing lights in the sky, you know, uh, and, and that's not even to talk about, you know, more, more recent sightings. These, these ancient ones speak to the same kind of phenomenon. And some things just don't change, it seems like. Yeah. You know, uh, I wonder if their technology changes over time, whoever is piloting these craft. You know what? That's a fascinating question. And, and it can go one of two ways. Yes. Or it could be like how the human civilization has been before it hit the 21st century, where like 100 year periods didn't change, you know? generations would live the exact same as the previous ones until we enter the technological age where things are changing every few years right that's insane it is it's absolutely i mean to to some degree we live on a planet where i mean we are the breakaway civilization if you figure some of these uncontacted tribes like in sierra leone or in the amazon you know, they live in a way that's more conducive with what human society was for tens upon tens of thousands of years. And then, you know, you have us who have become so digital and technologically reliant that you know, the slightest thing can disrupt our entire way of life and cause really big problems on the ground for people in, in day to day, all based on computer related problems. So it is a, a vulnerable, a vulnerable thing a vulnerability to be so technologically dependent. I wonder if they share that same vulnerability, whoever pilots these craft. Mm. But I think mean, it's neither here nor there. Let me, let me bring up another one of these ancient uh, sightings here. How about a spark from a falling star? Now, according to Pliny the Elder, another he's another big shot in history, Pliny the Elder, not to be confused with Pliny the Younger, everybody, but Pliny the Elder, he spoke of a star that grew as it descended until it appeared to be the size of the moon. It then ascended back up into the heavens and was transformed into a light. Now, when I think of something like this, I don't know if you've ever seen the famous footage of the UFO over the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. No, where it, I it descends, it, it descends over the mountain of the Dome of the Rock. It parks there for a minute. It flashes a few times and then it ascends back up into the sky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, insane. Yeah, insane. it real it's insane. really strange footage. Uh you know, but this is what kind of reminds me of this idea of a, of a craft mm -hmm. descending from the sky, making its presence felt or known, and then immediately retreating back and, and and we hear accounts of people encountering craft in that regard. Yeah. Uh, well, um, what, I like what he said that it was the size of the moon. Mm -hmm. That, I mean, my, my question would be the size of the moon when it's in the sky or like the size of the moon of how you think how big it would be. I like, that's my question. Do you think it was? Oh yeah. Proportionally. Did it, did it fill the sky to the same degree as the moon? Or are we talking about something like a craft, an enormous craft? Could you imagine something that large? I mean, that would that would cause gravi gravitational displacement around the planet. I think if something that big was to park itself in orbit. Yeah, we we can't have a Death Star here. No, no, no. You can have one orbiting Saturn, but not one orbiting here. No, <laughs> yeah, there is, because there is one orbiting Saturn. People. No, no, I kid, I kid. It just looks like the Death Star. It's just a moon. <laughs> in yeah. this case, it is just a moon. Um, you're right. Who knows? Because I'll get real weird and I'll start talking about the secret space program and how they're building craft out by Jupiter and we're already out there and stuff. We'll get so, <laughs> we'll get so off the deep end. Uh, I'm telling you, we'll be talking about that guy, Gary McKinnon, and he's hacking the Department of Defense and he's pulling up submarines that were backfitted to be UFOs. I'm telling you, it's all, it's all part of the problem. <laughs> and, 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 and it's hard to prove without facts. Like people, um, it's, it's just difficult to convince when there are when there is like no strong evidence but just like ideologies or opinions it, it, it's a matter of faith i always say this when it comes down mm. to this it becomes a matter of faith because it appeals to both our fears and 
our hopes. For a lot of people who believe in the UFO phenomenon, we hope of a day where they come out of the sky, they make peaceful contact, and they radically change our world for the better. So then do you, do you think, and, and, and I like that you said that because I've, I've had this thought for a while in my head of in the ancient times, right? We um, worshiped gods, right? That we end up finding, believing that they are now extraterrestrials watching, you know, a TV show, Ancient Aliens, <laughs> right? Um, right. Do you think that could repeat itself, or if they do come down, right? And we do, would we worship them as gods once again? I think it would really depend on how they portray themselves. I think if they came down and commanded to be worshipped as gods and displayed incredible amounts of power over us that we could not contend against, we'd have no choice. And then they would be absorbed into our mythology as gods over time. Uh, you know, they'd look back on this period of time, thousands of years later, and it would be so influenced by their presence, their their will their rules it would be the same way we see uh, any influence over a, a captive population and their occupiers you're going to see a huge influence over them uh, especially in the historical record yeah. so I, mean, uh, I get what you're saying and you and know, when you yeah. know, uh when it comes to this i have i mean i have to be very objective in my journalism and in the channel i tend not to give my opinions but there needs to be more proof seeping into the public domain now you know what i mean and with all the military videos and the pentagon authorizations of the video footage as well so that's really important to me is is getting the government or people of clearance right like high clearance to say yes or no i you know what i agree with you there it's um until we get real hard confirmation from either the presence of these beings undeniably proven before us by themselves or a revelation by the powers that are in control. We just have hearsay to go on. I mean, that's, that's it. We have people's secondhand stories and testimonies. We've got, yeah, videos of lights in the sky is great, but I mean, what, what does the video prove until we have one of these craft? Right. Well well, there's no one can say that we don't already. That's that's very true. Absolutely. I mean, you know what Bob Lazar claimed we had nine, right? Right, and then and then his story is definitely in question because he doesn't have any evidence to back himself up, which is disheartening um, for many, for many that oh, believe yeah. his story. <clears throat> I mean, it, it really again as a matter of faith and fear, it plays to our faiths and fears. We want these things to be true, you know, and at the same time, we're afraid if they are. I mean, people would be terrified if they found out we weren't alone. But with wanting so much, with having so much faith, for many, it can cause distortions in our views and things that we see. We believe something else because then our brain fills in the gaps of what we think it might be because of our faith. Oh, I agree. I absolutely agree. Faith, faith can color our vision, you know. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fundamental is a fundamental principle of faith that it shapes our vision and colors our worldview. And when we make these things like the UFO phenomenon and all its legends and lore that go around it, a matter of faith, we see even I mean, there's there's UFO religions out there that speak to it. There, I mean, are. there are testament to it. Think of, uh, uh, you know, the Raelians or the Unarians. You know, these are UFO religions, and, and there's no lack of, there's, I mean, there's lacks any better explanation for the fact that they worship UFOs, or they wait for the return of UFOs in a religious sense. So, well, I mean, faith is a big aspect of it, but what will really change people's minds, like you said, is the evidence. It is, and our, our civilization, our species needs the paradigm shift to realize that we are about to become a space-faring species. And hopefully in the coming months, more information will be released like the 180-day report and with the rover that China just launched to Mars. These kinds of things are helping us evolve 
into space with science? I, I think these kind of things, uh, you know, they help give people uh, hope, hope that we can do it. And I, I think we can do it, too. I think we can become that spacefaring civilization. You know, there was such a, a fear for, I mean, even a portion of my life growing up while the Cold War was still around, that we wouldn't make it because we'd wipe ourselves off the face of the earth over some <laughs> petty squabble. And now past that time, you know, we have our own challenges here in the modern era. They are different. But the hope is there that we do become this spacefaring civilization. And I hope that when we do, we encounter something out there. There's, there's a lot. I mean, yeah. there's there's already I forgot how many how much space junk we have, but that there's a ton. I think like what five hundred or five thousand. I'm probably so <laughs> off, but I mean, what what amazes me because said that you want to encounter something in space. There is so much junk out there in space, and telescopes are having so much difficulty seeing the stars, seeing planets because of all of the satellites that surround the Earth. It's I have seen some of those diagrams of the uh, of the space junk that's kind of floating around up there. It is it's it's pretty insane. It's pretty yeah. insane, and we make a lot of noise for a planet too. You know, there's a lot of chatter coming off the Earth. I guess if there was an advanced civilization, they would know we were here. You know, oh, that was like, me. Go you ahead. know, big beacon of love of noise. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there is. We make a lot of noise along with um, distributing a satellite in space that is constantly creating another kind of noise, hopefully for an alien civilization to be able to interpret it and hear not only music by Mozart, but how rain sounds, wind, and certain animals along with several languages. Oh, yeah. And, but oh, the now, great uh, just a moment here. I've got another super chat to get to real quick. From Chef Nation for $20. Thank you, Chef Nation. Chef Nation says you should get a pimp hat with that track suit. Um, I have had my eye on a witch hunter hat. Uh, it doesn't actually fit that mold. It looks more like a pilgrim style hat. Uh, but I don't know <laughs> if it would go with the cape I've been looking at. So we'll have to see. But thank you. <laughs> thank you, Chef Nation. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, you make me look really strange when we're talking about a track suit and a cape that I need to buy. <laughs> Again, this is where we're hanging out at. So you might as well need some pimp sunglasses too to really <laughs> yeah. finish up the look. <laughs> really, I have to get some fine sunglasses. Uh, something, uh, something really unique. Maybe something steampunk. Ooh, I like those ones that have like the sides that are covered. Those are good yeah, exactly, glasses. exactly. Maybe something round with the sides covered. You know, mm. something like that. Maybe something with an antique finish. We'll have to take a look. We'll have to take a look. I like it. I like where you're going with this, Pete. <laughs> so. Let's take another look at one of these other ancient encounters. This one happens on a battlefield in 74 BC. According to Plutarch, a Roman army commanded by Lucilius was about to begin a battle with Mithridates the sixth of Pontius, when all of a sudden the sky burst asunder and a huge flame-like body was seen to fall between the two armies. In shape, it was most like a wine jar, in color like molten silver. Plutarch reported the object in the shape of a wine jar, the apparently silvery object was reported by both armies. Now, who knows what happened to it, but something fell out of the sky in front of these two armies in 74 BC in color like molten silver in shape like a wine jar. Now, it doesn't say how big it was, but something came flaming out of the sky and landed between these two armies reported by both of them. Yeah, and in, in 74 uh, BC, I'm not really too sure how wine jars looked, but were they kind of like oval shaped? Like, uh, in, a, like in a clay jar? Like, how, do you, how did that look? It was described as a pithos, a pithos. So let's see. A pithos jar is uh, kind of shaped like an egg that flouts open at the top. Mm. So, so kind of like a flying saucer? Uh, more like an egg corn. So I guess, you know, in some cases, yeah, like a flying saucer, if you're going to think like Kexburg or De Glocken, De Glocka, De Glock, the bell. <laughs> yes. Okay. I, I understand. That's, 
That's interesting. And that's a lot of eyewitnesses. So if it was um, written down, right, and they had those witnesses of two armies, you know that's hundreds of thousands of people that saw it. May maybe tens of thousands, depending on how big this war was. But that's right. a lot of witnesses. That is, that is a good amount of witnesses. I mean, we were talking about, uh, you know, two armies of, of no less than, I mean, they had to be thousands. You're right, thousands of people yeah. who saw this thing happen. And, and the sky burst asunder when this occurred. So uh, something exploded in the sky and this huge flame-like body was seen to fall. So they describe it as being huge. But nobody describes what happens to it. I guess maybe they buried it. Maybe they fought around it. Maybe they recovered it and sent it somewhere. You know, that's a very strange thing to wonder what became of such a, uh, of an object. Mm -hmm. And what one would wonder what it was. Could it be some kind of ancient satellite? You know, there's there's all this talk of the Black Knight satellite being up there, supposedly 13,000 years old. You know, it's, it's a lot of far out uh, allegations for what is probably a heat blanket, right? But... The right. uh, the lore the lore is still there, you know, the mythology. Mm -hmm. the something mythology. I mean, so, something that explodes. I don't know. That's fascinating. That's a really cool yeah. story. That's a really really cool story, and especially the shape of an acorn or a bell, even a Nazi bell as well. That's also what it's called. Um, that's that that's not necessarily a as popular craft shape as a few others so that definitely stands out in the history books um of a craft i think that's that's really cool now um i i really i wonder what happened to this you know i really that's the thing that gets me like in, in a lot of these like strange crashes that we talk about in in, in ancient times or uh, even in medieval times, or maybe even in the 1800s, there were you know certain times and crashes were reported. And well, one wonders if these things were ever recovered, or if they were just left to like sit where they landed. Or maybe they land and then leave. I mean, look, I often think that about how alien species might send AI drones, and maybe that huge explosion that we just talked about could have been flash photography. <laughs> like we don't know. Right. <laughs> it's very possible how, again, we send rovers to planets before humans enter them, right? And, and they are AI. Mm -hmm. And we take pictures of other planets. So I don't see why if something comes down from another planet can't do the same thing. I, you know what? I don't, I don't doubt that at all. I often think that, you know, we, we hear these descriptions traditionally of these grays. And, you know, people talk about aliens. The first thing that pops in your mind is going to be the image of a zeta reticulin gray, the alleged grays of this UFO mythology. And I always say UFO mythology and UFO lore because that's what it is at the end of the day. There is a broad mythology built up around the lights in the sky. And I find it fascinating. But it is. It's mythology. And... These zeta reticulum grays, for lack of a better term, could be drones. There's no real indication for us to determine whether or not they're biological entities of any kind. They could be very advanced drones who are sent here to do what drones do, and that's recover uh, specimens or to take samples or to inspect for evidence or, you know, explore. And so... Um, well how did you come to that conclusion? Like what, what gave it away? Because, you know, I, the grays seem like a cross between insect like beings and robots, uh, according to some stories and reports. So uh, that's fascinating that you brought that up. Well, I mean, they, they would seem to have a drone quality to them. They, they appear to be incapable, at least in these reports of them. They appear to be incapable of, of understanding the kind of trauma that they inflict on people who encounter them. So either they don't care or they don't understand. And I think this lends itself towards the idea that they are mechanical in nature because a machine wouldn't care and wouldn't understand. It would just do what it does. Also, I think this uh, idea of a humanoid drone 
makes sense. The form and function of a humanoid body would uh, give it an advantage to do the kind of work an intelligent species would need it to do. Right. Or at least by our limited understanding of how a body works, you know, in our own respect to how we function here on this planet. And it's like you they're know, a ten armed creature from another world might have a better time doing, you know, uh, painting a room or something, you know. Absolutely. That's so true. <laughs> and um, it, it, it just seems like uh, they're incapable of showing emotions or sympathy or compassion. Which, mm -hmm. which is crazy. And our species, we have so many facial muscles. I mean, you can see me like throughout the whole day, I'll be making all these weird faces um, for, <laughs> for showing, because you know, I'm showing all these emotions like question, thoughtful, right. happy, um, and, and they don't seem to have any of those. No, no, you never hear that. And, 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 and what you do hear is uh, very common descriptions uh, that would indicate that there can't be differentiated between one and another. They all look exactly the same. Nobody's going to say, oh, well, this gray can be differentiated from that gray. Like, oh, there's Bob and there's Gary. You know, you don't hear that. What, what you hear are reports of being surrounded by these creatures who all look exactly the same, who function in, in a manner that is very robotic in, in, in intent. Well, you know, I, to, I, I guess with that kind of thought, it could be the same thing of when we look at a colony of aliens, they all look the same to us, but to them, they all look super different. <laughs> that could be true. That could be true. So even, even if they are drones or not, even though we can't distinguish that they're different, maybe they are. Maybe, maybe. You know, and, and people like to lump them in, too. Like, you know, the idea is that all greys are evil or all the reptilians are the bad guys or the good guys are the Nordics and the Pleiadians, you, you know, and and it is divided up like that into this comic book style, uh, you know, pantheon of good guys and cabal of bad guys that all kind of battle each other secretly, you know, either for our benefit or to our detriment. It is. It's like space opera. It is. It is like space <laughs> opera, Star Trek, Star Wars, all of it. And I think we'll come to a point of making cyborgs, robot AI, maybe even a cross between organics and electronics instead of rovers or the stereotypical probe devices. Um, we we will not risk ourselves when we're exploring. You know what I mean? Especially mm. with interacting with an aggressive race. No. No, not at all. Uh, and, and, and that's the thing. We don't know how aggressive they may or may not be once we come in contact with them. I mean, there was, a, there was an old uh, series uh, back in the day called Alien Nation. And it was about aliens that came to Earth. But they were refugees. They had been enslaved on another planet. And then it broke, broke free and came to Earth and had nothing to offer us. And it was a really great twist on the invader kind of idea. Like they came here with nothing, hat in hand, needed everything. And people resented them and treated them like second class citizens. And that was the premise of the series was like, you know, uh, the repercussions of these aliens coming to Earth and the interpersonal treatment of them and how they integrated into society. It was a really fascinating take on the idea of the genre. But uh, but yeah, I highly recommend it. Highly recommend. There was a film too, Alien Nation. I'm sure some of you out there in the chat remember that one, a classic. Speaking of the chat, I got a super chat to get to real quick from Shogun Orta. Thank you, Shogun Orta, for $5. Much appreciated. Shogun says, we don't care when we experiment on mice. Maybe greys see themselves above us so much they don't care either. That's a good point. It is. It is. And you know what? We could seem so aggressive to them. And this is my, this is my point. Like, how, how do we seem because we all kill each other, would it be better mm. to send drones like the Greys and not have that kind of emotion with others? Just robot versus robot kind of uh, conflicts in the future. I mean, you know, that's really what it's going to come down to. That's really what it's going to come down to, uh, at least for first world nations uh, uh, fighting proxies with, you know, probably second and third world countries. You know, you will still, still see loss of life, but I don't think it's long before you're right. We see deployed, you know, robotic 
troops. Yeah, and, and, and we're evolving so quickly right now that maybe hopefully 10, 20 years, we'll see what there is to come. Oh, it's going to be unimaginable. You know, I, 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 I think, that, you know, some of the stuff that we really take for science fiction is only a matter of time before we're using hologram phones and cell phones are a thing of the past, you know, or some, some new technology is going to come along that makes this stuff that we cherish so much now, so obsolete and, and thought of as so blase, you know? Uh, so yeah, I mean, we are, we are racing technologically leaps and bounds. Ginger Viking Jesus. Thank you so much. Ginger Viking Jesus. Uh, thank you. Ginger Viking Jesus for $10. Much appreciated. Ginger says one of the grays that were primarily seen are designed for a specific purpose. And we simply haven't seen the different variants because they simply aren't needed. IE infiltrators, extraction and recon. So uh, different grades for different jobs, maybe, maybe if they are drones, right? Well, even for people, we all have different jobs. That's true. That's true. And uh, and and if 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 we were to develop, you know, these uh, these highly advanced extraterrestrial, uh, not extraterrestrial or uh, artificial intelligence, they would all have different jobs too. But there's no reason to doubt that uh, any advanced civilization out there in space would have already developed an advanced AI. And and maybe the AI would have outlived it. Uh, are you familiar with the berserker theory? Go ahead and tell me, please. Uh, my understanding of berserker theory is that a alien species creates artificial intelligence. This artificial intelligence then outlives its alien creators. Whether it annihilates them or not is a moot point, but it outlives them one way or another. But then this alien species would eventually use up the resources of its own world and have to venture out into the stars to continue propagating itself. That kind of reminds me, I don't know if you ever watched the TV show Fringe. Have you seen it? With the no, I like haven't. Walter Bishop and all that. Well, anyways, at near the end, there is this species that is kind of robotic but also humanoid. And they used all of their resources on their planet, so they had to and outlived all of the previous generations that were more human. So they had to come down to the past of Earth and inhabit that. That was a really fascinating twist, especially at the very end okay. of the series. So I, I spoiled it for anyone that hasn't watched it yet. But, but <laughs> what you said, that was definitely the first thing that comes to mind. So if anyone that hasn't watched Fringe, definitely recommend the TV show. It's great. I, you know what? I think I've been recommended that a few times. Lesser Logic says Cylons. Yeah, uh, Battlestar Galactica, that's another one. Uh, Team Tomazusi says Fringe is dark. Really dark. <laughs> really dark. Okay. It's good. It's good. Uh, what about uh, Sniffles117 says, like the Borg. What about the Borg, this idea of a cybernetic race that might be, uh, might be more realistic than a lot of different ideas concerning extraterrestrial life? What if there was a singularity that occurred on another planet where those creatures incorporated technology into their bodies and became a hybrid cybernetic race. I think that's a real plausibility when it comes to alien life, but I, you know, I, I think so, but I actually put a poll up. This is totally related. I uh -huh. put a poll up on my website the other day and I used the original Blade Runner movie. Have you seen that movie? Blade oh Runner. yeah yeah so good so it depicted a 2019 los angeles looking more advanced having callings on other worlds mm. and replicants you know we, we all know the story so right. i asked people if they were stunned or retarded in any in in our technology and and why like why do you think we haven't been evolving as fast like how we thought we would be in what the 1970s about like 2020 we would have we, we would already be on the moon living there. 
Right. So the biggest majority of people said yes. And we were retarded because of oil and corporate greed. Ah, oh, that like broke my heart. But at the same time, <laughs> it, it's so true. And it, you know what? I th- I really do think so as well. Uh, we are still driving around in gas driven vehicles. And how long has it been since we landed on the moon? You know, like yeah. it's, it's been a really, really long time. And the I 70s. just, I, right? look that's 50 years that's 50 years (laughs) i i just feel like we're being held back and that was the poll that was just the poll winning result um disheartening like gas come on guys like oil and gas why (laughs) well you know it's 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 such an interconnected economy who knows how things would radically alter if we did have a uh, free renewable energy that was sustainable in, in a radically life changing way that could create utopian civilization, you know, until that is developed, you know, we are kind of stuck with what we're stuck with. And that's uh, this kind of uh, mishmash hybrid kind of green attempt. And of course our reliance on coal and gas. You know, it's uh, it's a sticky wicket, but it's unfortunately it's the way we're kind of built right now. And until yeah, something changes just, that, and that could, for so long. Yeah, it has been that way for so long. You, you'd figure something else would come along and change that, especially when it comes. I mean, I mean, we do have electric vehicles now. There are electric vehicles. You don't see as many charging stations for them as you'd expect, and it does take a while for them to build up a charge. But you do see more electric vehicles, which is a good thing. You got I mean, the self-driving stuff is pretty amazing. Yeah. We're sort of getting smarter. Yeah, like, I mean, smarter, but if you get into a car crash, like, you won't make it. Now that cars yeah. are made so thin, it's like, yeah, sure, they're they're aerodynamic and they save on gas, but, like, you, you, just, you just hit, like, a bush and you have a huge dent in your car. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. They don't make them like they used to. Back in the day, there were tanks. Oh my gosh, but they chugged up gas like a beast. They really did. They really, that's well, that's what they are. Good gas guys with tanks. <laughs> <laughs> gas guy, remember them. You know, every, every car when I was a kid was a big metal tank. <laughs> yeah, but see, but you could hit anything and your car would be in one piece. You would just kind of bounce back a little bit, get a little whiplash, but <laughs> yeah, you're good. And, and I wonder that about UFOs too, because, you know, we have these sightings that were definitive saucers back in the day. And then you have sightings that are cigars. And when I think of saucers and cigars, I think of metal craft. And then when you think of these other things that are like just purely lights in the sky, sometimes these lights divide. Sometimes these lights form uh, formations. Sometimes they reform back into a single light and then disappear into the sky. You know, we're, we're talking about maybe an evolution in technology or are we talking about two different phenomena altogether? Are you familiar with atmospheric beasts, perhaps? Oh, no, tell me. But actually, before you tell me, I wanted to hit on a comment that I just saw in your chat about uh-huh. mining, about mining the moon. And this is fascinating. So about mining the moon and resources on the moon. And I wanna say like, yes to the person that wrote it. I completely agree. There's a possibility of mining helium three in a va- in vast amounts. Uh, that's something that I'm surprised that we haven't been focused on as an advanced energy source. So it's like, we have these resources on the moon, but we haven't been to the moon in 50 years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Or have we? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not here to speculate. I, just... well, I, I am here to speculate. Ingo Swan remote viewed the moon and he saw aliens up there that were making people mine. So never forget, remote viewers have seen strange stuff on the moon. <laughs> There's something else. I, I think that's great, though. And I really appreciate that you don't get into a lot of speculation. Like, I think it's it's really great that you're more obsessed with the nuts and bolts and what's happening in the day to day on the ground between whistleblowers and the government and the UFO phenomenon. I love I, that. And that's I, why I the following can't. works so closely. <laughs> well, the thing is that I just, I just can't speculate. It, 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 it goes against journalism and then it, it puts you in a certain category that people just don't believe you don't want to hear your work. Does that make sense? But that doesn't mean oh, yeah. that I don't, that, that I don't do it behind closed doors at home. You know, like it's totally different. <laughs> yeah. But, but when, when it comes to something like this or, or talking about 
online, it can only be facts and absolutely no to very little opinions. I understand that. I understand that. You know, I, I, I always tell people here, my opinions are the least important when it comes <laughs> to what we talk about. You know, we, we have these conversations each and every night here. And, and what I think is really moot, you know, I, if I can offer a, a nugget of information that I might have retained from reading something, I'm always happy to share. But my opinions aren't really that that important when it comes to it. I like to I like to inspire people to delve into what might be possible in this world. You know, absolutely, uh, and, and, and opinions possibility. And opinions make a big difference. They they change the world. Ideas, you know. But yeah, absolutely. But working for the debrief, you know, they are facts only. And um, mm -hmm. I I interviewed Lou Elizondo a while back. I think it's like almost yeah. a month now. And he had to be so careful with his speculations. He did turn down three of my questions, though, because <laughs> of like having to give only facts. Because because e even he is like a, a public figure that he can't give his opinions. Oh yeah, well I, I can understand that, you know, absolutely. Especially when you are so prominent in the field, uh, you know, you have to be choice with your words, you know. Yeah, yeah, you do, you do, to the best of your ability. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but there are people out there doing great work, you know. Like I, 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 you know, I, I, I follow you guys. Uh, you know, the, there's a whole community that, that you you work with that is fascinating and is doing great work in that regard. Uh, and I think that you're doing cutting edge work. I'm watching you on the streams. I'm watching you on your channel. I hope everybody goes ahead and subscribes. I think Jesse Miller just dropped a link to your channel. There's also a link down in the description of this video. I didn't do halftime today. I normally do halftime where I play a little music and I, I do the halftime spiel, but we skipped it today because we're having a good conversation. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to tell you this. There is a link to Christina's channel down in the description of this video. It is the first link. And Jesse has also dropped it in the chat. Uh, we have 85 people in the chat right now. Hopefully, we see 85 to 500 new subscribers on Christina's channel over the next day or two. So I'd like to see that for everybody who watches this. Please go ahead and subscribe. Support her work. Uh, she is up and coming uh, in the world of ufology and in this research. And I'll tell you what, definitely get into that community now because it is going up to the top number one with a bullet i'm telling you it, it, is, it, it is the it cutting edge of her stuff it, it really is. is blowing up it's insane so if you catch up <laughs> on it now you won't look crazy like <laughs> you won't yeah. look so dumb in a year or two when people are like <laughs> oh yeah i've already heard of this and you're like what exactly exactly it's it's blowing up, especially with the news report that was just dropped yesterday of the USS Omaha. Uh, that was insane. And the Pentagon set authenticated the video saying, mm -hmm. yes, it is real. And it was published on um, Fox News along with the debrief. Jeremy Corbell was the one that dropped the footage. Um, should we talk about it? Do you yeah. Want to talk about it? Yeah, absolutely. So it's so it's it's it, I I don't know if it's going to be as big. But it's to me, I would categorize it as big as the Nimitz incident that happened in mm. 2017 when that was dropped. This one is a um, transmedium object that goes from the sky into the ocean that was recorded by the USS Omaha. And that is fascinating. People are jumping all over it. And it is now entering the mainstream media. So if you are now jumping into the UFO topic, um, having this knowledge is i think really going to help you in the near future to where you're able to hopefully handle the information better and not be so shocked when another something really big drops yeah um speaking of big things dropping you now this 180 day report is fast coming up on us and you know this is something even on my channel although we we don't really delve with current events something i couldn't ignore so we addressed it as soon as it dropped in the news and we've been waiting with bated breath for june to roll around so we can see what comes out in this report are you hopeful or are you thinking it's going to be a lot of redacted material i don't know i don't know i've i've heard from many like many people that have been talking about this that yes uh, probably and and i think for people that are already following the ufo topic it might not be a big shocker but um 
but for people that may not know about it, it could be really big news. Yeah. But what I am saying is tomorrow people should watch the 60 Minutes. Like it's going to be all about UFOs, and that's going to be fascinating. Oh, that's right. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm a little leery when it comes to the big three networks and it comes to UFO information because they're so in touch with the government and always have been. Uh, who knows what they're giving us is going to be, you know, disinformation or not. So I'm, I'm, a, I, little, uh, I'm a little skeptical, but we'll see. I, I can see what you're saying, but also the fact that they're even putting it out there instead of ignoring it is a really big step. It is. It is. It's a step in the right direction, too. It definitely is. Exactly. So we'll see. We'll see how it comes out. Yeah, okay, whatever brought LOL in the chat says, we redacted some redacted redacted. <laughs> 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 Pretty good one. Yeah, okay, whatever brought LOL. <laughs> <laughs> Jesse Miller, the crow's nest, mentions the little government magic marker. Yeah, that, that would be it. So listen, we've got about five minutes left. Um, so let me do this real quick. Um, let me. Uh, why don't you tell everybody where to find you? I know uh, you did mention the debriefed, but there's also your channel, uh, Christina Gomez, Paradigm Shifts. Um, where else do you, you got a, a link tree, right? Uh, yeah, I have a beacon, but um, please take a look at my YouTube at Paradigm Shifts. I have almost a year's worth of UFO sighting submissions um, that are enhanced, zoomed in, where you can make your own conclusions, along with take a look at my Twitter at eyes underscore on the skies, where I post a ton of really fascinating updates about science, space, everything in between. Hopefully I get to see you guys there because you're going to have a little bit of fun. Yeah, I definitely. Guys, go subscribe. Support Christina Gomez and her efforts in researching the UFO phenomenon. I'm telling you, this is this. I'm going to look back on this interview one day. I'm going to be like, I'll tell you what, I interviewed her back before she was a big star and was on the TV shows because that is what's going to happen, folks. You keep your eyes on her, I'm telling you what's up. Keep you your eyes on the sky. One day, you're going to find you're on there not speculating. <laughs> <laughs> Watch out, Giorgio Sukalos will be knocking at your door. Oh my gosh, have you, but before I go, have did you see the TV show called Resident Alien? I've heard a lot of good things about it. Yeah, well, I've, I've watched reviews on it too. It's, I recommend it, it's hilarious. Anyways, Giorgio Sukalos um, was a guest in one of the episodes and it oh, was no. so funny, it was so <laughs> funny. <laughs> So listen, I want to thank you so much for joining us tonight. I really appreciate your time. I know you've been super busy, not only with your finals, but with your work uh, on your own channel and the debriefed and, and all the other channels you've been appearing on, uh, you know, just delving into the UFO phenomenon. So thank you so much for joining us. Hopefully we can get to do this again in the near future. And Absolutely. I do appreciate your time. I'm, I'm sure the audience here had a great time with you too. Everybody's saying good things to hear. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, Unidentified Celebrity Review says, Pete, I got to get you on my show. Well, Unidentified hey, Celebrity Review, I feel the same way about you. I love your style. I love your charisma. And I want to get you on my show, too. So we share that sentiment, good sir. So, yes. <laughs> so, thank you. Um, but thank you again, Christina. And we'll thank talk you. to you soon. And thank you. I'll let you go now. I'm going to do my goodbyes to the crowd. You have a great night. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. All right, everybody, let me go ahead and uh, play the thing real quick. Here's the thing I made, if you if you haven't heard it, here's the thing. This kind of broadcasting only works in this country. Here in America, we put on the programs that you enjoy, and we simply come to you and ask you to support them. Help this system of broadcasting work. We need to hear from you. We also are looking for a lot of new subscribers right now. So please, become a new subscriber and help us reach our goal of 12,000 new subscribers. But the most important thing is to get that money in and into our studios right away so that we can bring you more programs like this and you can do that on a visa mastercard or american express all right you know how we do it it's that time of night that's how we do that's how we do I think I just got another super chat coming real quick. Hold on a second. From Ginger Viking Jesus for $5. Thank you, Ginger Viking Jesus. Ginger Viking Jesus says, I think come June our world could get a lot bigger. Fing fingers crossed, aliens. Whenever I'm outside, my eyes are almost always looking up. Oh, antediluvian. There's a glass of a tumbler and a cheers. 
Thank you, Ginger Viking Jesus. Much appreciated. Thank you very much. And I want to say thank you to Irrelevant, Jack D. Whiskey, It's Courtney, Chef Nation, for a big generous super chat night. Thank you. Shogun Orta, as well as Ginger Viking Jesus. All of you for your generous super chats. Much appreciated. Never expected. Always appreciated. Big thank you to our guest, Christina Gomez, of Paradigm Shifts UFO. Please go down to the link in her in the description and subscribe to her channel. Do so now. Check out the links for all my social media stuff as well, if you're so interested. Oh, Conflict Radio officials here. What's up, Conflict Radio? Guys, don't hesitate to subscribe to Conflict Radio. I'll be doing another appearance on that channel in June. So, yes, go subscribe. They do great stuff every week on that channel. It is a fun show. Um, but with that said, I want to thank you all for being here. I want to thank our moderators, Jesse Miller at the Crow's Nest, Tina Tomaszewski, and Big Steve. Thank you so much for being here. We'll be back at 3 a.m. with another topic. We're going to do Stardust Ranch. So I'll see you back here at 3 a.m. if you're so inclined. 3 a.m., Stardust Ranch. We're talking about Stardust Ranch at 3 a.m. So this is Pete, your host. You've been watching The Creepy Little Book. And until next time, stay creeped out.